the evening. Let's see if someone will join us. Today we are here at my fireplace to hear some good ghost stories for long winter nights. And uh, I am Krampus Eric. In, well, uh, who is the Krampus? Okay, please uh, uh, look for something about uh, uh, North Italian and even Austrian folklore, and so you'll see who is the Krampus. For now, you are all welcome here. Uh, sadly, at the beginning of December, I, I was very, very busy educating your children with uh, very, very modern means. So I couldn't uh, share some free time with you and I couldn't tell you some interesting stories. But this night, before the year ends, uh, I'll enjoy with you some ghastly tales. Um, by the way, I have chosen my golden horns instead of the black ones because we are all waiting for the light of the new year. Okay, so also my horns, uh, um, also my horns have been chosen on this purpose. They are a little more uh, sunny than usual. Well, okay, please. Uh, say goodbye to my beloved, to my beloved whip, because this night I won't need it. I have to hold books, books like these. Spirits of the season, have you seen it? Okay, it's a good uh, book of uh, Christmas home things. And it's good also for the end of the year. <laughs> because we are still in winter, so why, why not uh, enjoy some uh, good scares? <laughs> why you not enjoy some, uh, some good uh, ghost stories? Okay, someone has been... Well, sorry, I had received uh, an invitation. I don't know what... I don't know what uh, is this. But let's go to our book. I have chosen a tale about, uh, about a Christmas theater play. A Christmas theater play that's uh, more exciting than usual because the theater is haunted. Okay, no, it's um, nothing about the Phantom of the Opera. It's a tale by J.B. Priestley, one uh, of his, um, of his uh, few ghost stories. Uh, it was uh, written in January 1931, and its title is The Demon King. <laughs> okay, so you can guess why I love it very much. Let's see if uh, someone has uh, written. Okay, I see several people. Several people are um, taking part to this, but no one has written. Okay, so let's go. Welcome to you, all, uh, to you all, by the way. Let's read The Demon King. Among the company assembled for Mr. Tom Bart's grand annual pantomime at the old Theatre Royal, Brothersford, there was a good deal of disagreement. They were not quite the jolly friendly party they pretended to be, though the good offices of Thespian to the readers of the Brothersford Herald and Weekly Herald Budget. The principal boy told her husband about 55 other people that she could work with anybody, was famous for being able for, to work with anybody, but that nevertheless the management had gone and engaged, and as principal girl, the one woman in the profession who made it almost impossible for anybody to work with anybody. Okay, so the principal boy, the main actor, is a woman who will, of course, uh, play her part uh, in, um, in male garments, and she doesn't like very much the principal girl. Okay, it happens. The principal girl told her friend, the second boy, that the principal boy and the second girl were spoiling everything and might easily ruin the show. Oh, the fairy queen went about pointing out that she did not want to make trouble being notoriously easygoing, but that sooner or later the second girl would hear a few things that she would not like. Okay, so 
a Christmas show is um, is going to be staged about the actors, or I should say the actresses, uh, don't like uh, one another. Oh, it happens. Johnny Wingfield had been heard to declare that some people did not realize even yet that what audiences wanted from a panto was some good fast comedy work by the chief comedian who had to have all the scope he required. Dippy and Doppy, the broker's man, hinted that even if there were two stages, Johnny Wingfield would want them both all the time. But they were all agreed on one point, namely, that there was not a better demon in provincial panto than Mr. Kirk Ayrton, who had been engaged by Mr. Tom Bart for this particular show. <sniffs> the pantomime was Jack and Jill, and those people who are puzzled to know what demons have to do with Jack and Jill, those innocent water, fetch water fetchers, should pay a visit to the nearest pantomime, which will teach them a lot they did not know about fairy tales. Kirk Ayrton was not merely a demon, but the Demon King. And when the curtain first went up, you saw him on a dark and stage standing in front of a little chorus of attendant demons, made up of local baritons at baritons, hmm, at ten shillings a night. Ayrton looked the part, for he was tall and rather satanically featured and was known to be very clever with his makeup. And what was more important, he sounded the part too. For he had a tremendous bass voice, the mo of most demonish quality. Wow! Let's see if anyone has written. Okay. He had played Mephistopheles in Faust many times with a good touring opera company. Oh, so he's an opera singer. Great! I love this. <laughs> he was indeed a man with a fine future behind him. If it had not been for one weakness, Pantomime would never have seen him. The trouble was that for years now he had been in the habit of uh, lifting the elbows too much. He drank too much wine. Uh, that was how they all put it put it. Nobody said that he drank too much, but all agreed that he lifted the elbow. There's a way to say things, <laughs> after all. And the, bro and the problem now was, would there be trouble because of this elbow lifting? lifting? Of course, one can't be drunk on the night of the play. He had rehearsed with enthusiasm, sending his great voice to the back of the empty, forlorn gallery in the two numbers allotted to him, but at the later rehearsals there had been ominous signs of elbow lifting. <sighs> Going to be all right, Mr. Ayrton? The stage manager inquired anxiously. Ayrton raised his formidable and satanic eyebrows, just like mine. <laughs> Of course it is, he replied, somewhat hoarsely. What's worrying you, old man? And the other explained hastily that he wasn't worried. Uh, you'll go well here, he went on. They'll eat those two numbers of yours, very musical in these parts. But uh, you know, Brothers Ford, of course, uh, you've played here before. Uh, I have, replied, replied Ayrton grimly. And I love the damn place. Bors, Misty, oh, nothing to do in it. Oh, perhaps this is, this is why he lifted the elbow too much. He, he had nothing to do in a Brothers Ford besides drinking, after all. Poor, poor guy. This was not reassuring. The stage manager knew only too well Mr. Ayrton was already finding something to do in the town, and his enthusiastic description of the local golf courses had no effect. Ayrton loved golf too, it seemed, all very ominous. They were opening on Boxing Day night. By the afternoon, it was known that Kirk Ayrton had been observing, observed lifting the elbow very determinedly in the smoke room of the Cooper's Arms near the theater. One of the stage hands had seen him. And by God, he wore letting it up and all, said this gentleman. No bad judge of anybody's power of suction. <laughs> From there it appeared he had vanished, along with several other riotous persons, two of them thought to be Leeds men, and in Brothers Ford they know what Leeds men are. 
The curtain was due to rise at uh, 7.15 sharp. Most members of the company arrived at the theater very early. Kirk Ayrton was not one of them. He was still absent at 6.30, so he had to wear an elaborate makeup with glittering tints and eyelids and all the rest of it, and had to be on the stage with the curtain when the curtain rose. A messenger was dispatched to his lodgings, which were not far from the theater, even before the messenger returned to say that Mr. Ayrton had not been in since noon. The stage manager was desperately coaching one of the local bar baritones, the best of a stiff and a stupid lot, in the part of the Demon King. At 6.45, no Ayrton. At 7, no Ayrton. It was hopeless. Oh, gosh. Theater people like me know what this means. It's terrible. All right, that fellow's done for himself now said the great Mr. Bart, who had come to give his grand annual his blessing. He doesn't get another engagement from me as long as he lives. What's this, this local chap like? The stage manager groaned and wiped his brow. Uh, like nothing on earth except a bow-legged bar baritone from Wesleyan Choir. <laughs> He'll have to manage somehow. You'll have to cut the part. Cut it, Mr. Bart! I slaughtered it! And what's left of it? He'll slaughter! Ah, oh, Mr. Tom Bart, like the sensible manager he was, he lived in a pantomime opening in the old-fashioned way with a mysterious dark scene among the supernaturals. I agree, too. Let's see if you have written no, no one, no message. Okay. Here it was a cavern in the hill bin beneath the magic well, and in these dismal recesses the demon king and his attendants were to be discovered, waving their crimson cloaks and plotting evil and good around the chest notes. Then the demon king would sing his number, which had nothing whatever to do with the Jack and Jill or demonology either. The fairy queen would appear, accompanied by a white spotlight, there would be a little dialogue between them, and then a short duet. The cavern scene, sorry, I have to refuse an invitation. The cavern scene was all set, the five attendant demons were in their places, while the sixth, now acting as king, was receiving a few last instructions from the stage manager and the orchestra, beyond the curtain, were coming to the end of the overture, when suddenly, from nowhere, there appeared on the dimly lighted stage a tall and terrifically imposing figure, like a Krampus. <laughs> <laughs> My god, there's Ayrton, cried the stage manager, and bust all the cross, leaving the temporary demon king abandoned, a pitiful makeshift now. The new arrival was coolly taking his place in the center, he looked. He looked superb. The costume, a skin-tight crimson affair, touched with a beautiful green, was far better than the one provided by the management. And the makeup was better still. The face had a greenish phosphorescent glow and its eyes flashed between glittering lids. When he first caught sight of the face, the stage manager felt a sudden idiotic tremor of fear. But being a stage manager first, and a human being afterwards, as all stage managers have to be, he did not feel that tremor long, for it was soon chased away by a sense of elation. It flashed across his mind that Ayrton must have gone running off to Leeds or somewhere in search of this stupendous costume and makeup. Good old Ayrton! He had given them all a fright, but it had been worth it. All right, Ayrton, said the stage manager quickly. All right, replied the demon king with a magnificent, careless gesture. Well, you get back in the chorus then, and the stage, said the stage manager to the Weasley and Barrington. Ah, that'll do me, champion, said the gentleman with a sigh of relief. He was not ambitious. Oh, already! The violins began playing a shivering sort of music, and up the curtain went. The six attendant demons, led by the Wesleyan, uh, who was in good voice now that he felt, he felt such a sense of relief, uh, told the audience who they were and hailed their monarch in the appropriate form. 
the demon king towering above them, dominating the scene superbly, replied in a voice of astonishing strength and richness. Then he sang the number allotted to him. It had nothing to do with Jack and Jill and very little to do with demons, being a rather commonplace bass song about sailors and shipwrecks and storms with thunder and lightning effects supplied by the theatre. Undoubtedly, this was the same song that had been rehearsed. The words were the same, the music was the same, yet it seemed different. It was really sinister. As you listened, you saw the great waves breaking over the doomed ships and the pitiful little white face disappearing in the dark flood. Somehow the storm was much stormier. There was one great clap of thunder and flash of lightning that made all the attendant demons. The conductor of the orchestra and the number. There was one great clap of thunder and flash of lightning that made all the attendant demons. Said the stage manager after running round to the other way. Said the stage manager after running round to the other way. Press here, said the man in charge of the two sheets of tin and the cannonball. Uh, didn't touch a thing that time, did we, mate? said Horace. If you ask me, somebody le let off a firework, one of them big Chinese crackers for that one, his mate continued. Somebody monkeying about, that's what it is. And now a white spotlight had found its way onto the stage, and there, shining in its pure ray, was Miss Dulcie Farrer, the fairy queen, who was busy wa waving a silver, a silver wand. She was also busy controlling her emotions, for somehow she felt unaccountably nervous. Opening night is opening night, of course, but Miss Ferrer had been playing Fairy Queen for the last ten years, and the principal girls for the ten years before them, <laughs> and there was nothing in this part to worry her. She rapidly came to the conclusion that it was Mr. Ayrton's sudden reappearance, after she had made up her mind that he was not turning up, that had made that had made the hair feel so shaky, and this caused the hair to feel rather resentful. Moreover, as an experienced fairy queen who had had trouble with demons before, she was, she was convinced that he was about to take more than his share of the stage, just because he had hit upon such a good makeup, and it was a good makeup, there, there could be no question about that. Let's see if you have questions, by the way. No. No one. But I see, I see a lot of participation. That's good. Okay, guys. Where, where were we? Okay. That greenish face, these glittering eyes, really, it was awful. <gasps> Overdoing it, she called it. After all, a pento was a pento. Uh, Miss Ferrar, still waving her wand, moved a step or two near and cried, I know you horrid plot, you evil thing, and I defy you, though you are the demon king. <laughs> what? You? he roared contemptuously, pointing a long forefinger at her. Miss Ferrar should have replied, Yes, I, the Queen of Fairyland. But for a minute, she could not get out a word. As that horribly long forefinger shot out at her, she had felt a sudden sharp pain and had then found herself unable to move. She stood there, her wand held out at a ridiculous angle, motionless, silent, her mouth wide open. But her mind was active enough. Is it a stroke? It was asking feverishly. Like Uncle Edgar had that time at Greenwich. Oh, it must be. Oh, whatever shall I do? Oh, 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 The Demon King's sinister bane mirth resounded through the theater. <laughs> This was from the Wesleyan and his friends, and there was a very poor chorus of, love, of laughs, dubious, almost apologetic. It suggested that the Wesleyan and his friends were out of their debt, the debt of respectable brothers for, brothers for young demons. 
Their king now made a quick little gesture with one hand, and Miss Ferrer found herself able to move and speak again. Indeed, the next second, she was not sure that she had ever been unable to speak and move. That horrible minute had vanished like a tiny bad dream. She defied him again, and this time nothing happened beyond an exchange of bad lines of lame verse. There were not many of these, however, for there was the duet to be fitted in, and the whole scene had to be, had to be played in as short a time as possible. The duet in which the two supernatura supernaturals only defied one another all over again was early dirty by way of the local musical director. After singing a few bars each, they had a rest, while the musical director exercised his 14 instrumentalist in a most imposing operatic passage. Oh, I love this. Uh, it was during this half of that Miss Ferrer, who was now quite close to her fellow duetist, whispered, You're in great voice tonight, Mr. Ayrton. I wish I was. Too nervous. Don't know why, but I am. Wish I could get it out like you. She received, as a reply, a flash of those glittering eyes. It really was an astonishing makeup, and a curious little signal with the long four fingers. There was no time for more, for now the voice part began again. But before, before hearing the voice part, let's see if you have written something. Okay, there are no chats, no messages. Okay, I suppose you are listening to this wonderful tale. Nobody in the theater was more surprised by what happened than the fairy queen herself. She could not believe that the marvelously rich soprano voice that came pealing and soaring belonged to her. It was tremendous. Covent Garden would have acclaimed it. Never before in all her twenty years of hard vocalism had Miss Dulcie Ferrer sang like that, though she had always felt that somewhere inside her there was a voice of that quality only waiting the proper signal to emerge and then astonish the world. Now, in some fantastic fashion, it had received that signal. Not that the fairy queen overshadowed her supernatural colleague. Colleague, sorry. There was no overshadowing him. He trolled in a, di a diapason bus and with a fine fairy of gesture, the pair of them turned turned that stolen and botched duet into a work of art and significance. You could hear heaven and hell at, at battle in it. The curtain came down on a good rattle of applause. They are very fond of music in Brothersford, but unfortunately the people who attended the first night of the pantomime are not the people who are most fond of music, otherwise there, there would have been a furore. Great stuff, that, said that. Mr. Tom Bart, who was on the spot, <laughs> never mind, Jim, let them, let them they take a curtain. Go on, you two, take the curtain. And when they had both bowed their, their acknowledgments, Miss Ferrer, excited and trembling, the demon king cool and amused, almost contemptuous, Mr. Bart continued, that would have stopped the show in some places, absolutely stopped the show. But the trouble here is that they won't applaud, won't, won't get going easily. Uh, that's true, that's true, Mr. Bart, Miss Ferrer observed. They take a lot of warming up here. <laughs> I wish they didn't. Not you, Mr. Ayrton. Uh, easy to warm them, said the tall crimson figure. Well, if anything could, that ought to have done, the lady remarked. Uh, that's so, said Mr. Bart condescendingly. You are great, Ayrton, but they won't let... Uh... Sorry, I have an invitation. Okay, let's go on. Yes, they will. The demon king, who appeared to be taking his part very seriously, for he had not yet dropped into his ordinary tones, flicked his long fingers in the air, roughly in the direction of the auditorium, gave a short laugh, turned away and then somehow completely vanished, though it was not difficult to do that in those crowded wings. Half an hour later, Mr. Bart, his manager, and the singer all decided that something must have gone wrong with Brothersford. Liquor must have been flowing like water in the town. That was the only explanation. Either, either they're all drunk or I 
I'm yeah. the stage manager. <laughs> I've been giving and pantomime here for 520 years, said Mr. Bart, and I've never known it happen before. Well, nobody can say they're not enjoying it. Enjoying it? They're enjoying it too much. They're, they're going deaf. Honestly, I don't like it. It's too much of a good thing. The stage manager looked at his watch. Hmm, it's holding up the show, that's certain. God knows uh, when uh, we're going to get through at this rate. If they're going to behave like this every night, we'll have to cut an hour out of it. Listen to them now, said Mr. Bart. And that's one of the oldest gags in the show. Listen to them. Nay, that shit, they must be all half seas over. What had happened? Why this? That the audience had suddenly decided to go in a fashion never known in brothers for the before. The brothers for audience are notoriously difficult to please. Not so much because their taste is so exquisite, but rather because without many, they insist upon having their money's worth and usually arrive at a place of entertainment in a gloomy and suspicious frame of mind. Really tough managers like to open a new show in Bradford, knowing very well that if it will go there, it will go anywhere. But for the last half hour of this pantomime, there had been more laughter and applause than the Theatre Royal had known for the past six months. Every entrance produced a storm of welcome. The smallest and stalest gags set the whole house screaming, roaring and rocking. Every song was determinedly in chord. If the people had been especially brought out of jail for the performance, they could not have been more easily pleased. <sighs> Here, said Johnny Wayne as he made an exit as a dame pursued by a cow. This is frightening me. What's the matter with him? Is this a new way of, of giving the bird? Huh, don't ask me, said the principal boy. The principal boy. I was surprised that they gave me such a nice welcome when I went on because I've always been a favorite here, as Mr. Bart will tell you. But the way they're carrying up now, making such a fuss over nothing, it's a simply ridiculous. How's slowing up, slowing up the show, too? After another quarter of an hour of this monstrous enthusiasm, this delirium, Mr. Bart could be heard grumbling to the principal girl, with whom he had standing in that close proximity with principal girls somehow invite. I'll tell you what it is, Alice, Mr. Bart was saying. If this goes on much longer, I'll make a speech from the stage asking them to draw it mild. There are no name to behave like this. And it's a funny thing, I was only saying to somebody, now who was it that I said that to? Anyhow, I was only saying to somebody that I wish that his audience would let themselves, themselves go a bit more. Well, now I wish they wouldn't, and that's that. There was a chuckle, not loud, rich and distinctly audible. Here, cried Mr. Bart, who's there? What's the joke? It was obviously nobody in their immediate vicinity. It sounded like a Kirk Ayrton, a sensible girl, judging by the voice. But Ayrton was nowhere to be seen. Indeed, one or two people who had been looking for him, both in his dressing room and behind, had not been able to find him. But he would not be on again for another hour, and nobody had time to discover whether Ayrton was drinking or not. <laughs> the other thing was, that the audience lost its wild enthusiasm just as suddenly as it had found it, and long before the interval had turned itself into the familiar stolid brothers for the crowd, grimly waiting for its many swore. The pantomime went on its way exactly as rehearsed, until it came to the time when the demons had to put in another appearance. Jack, having found the magic water and tumbled down the hill, had to wander into the mysterious cavern and there, and there rest a while. At least he declared that he would rest, but being played by a large and shapely female, and probably having that uh, restless feminine temperament, what he, he did do was to sing a popular song with immense gusto. At the end of that song, when Jack once more declared that he would rest, the Demon King had to make a sudden reappearance through a trapdoor. 
and it was reported from below where a springboard was in readiness that no demon king had arrived to be shot onto the stage. Hmm, I don't like this. Now where, oh where the devil has our tongue got to? Where, where the devil? Well, you've named, it, you've named it right, I think. Moaned the stage manager, sending people right and left up and down to find him. The moment arrived, Jack spoke his and her cue, and the stage manager was making frantic, frantic signals to her from the wings. Oh, where? Ah, screamed Jack and, pro and produced the most realistic bit of business in the whole pantomime. For the stage directions, uh, read shows fright, and Jack undoubtedly did show fright as well as uh, he or she might, for no sooner was the cue spoken that there came a horrible green flash, followed by a crimson, gl a crimson glare, and standing before her, having apparently arrived from nowhere, was the Demon King. Jack was now in the power of the Demon King and would remain in those evil clutches until rescued by Jill and the Fairy Queen. And it seemed as if the principal boy had suddenly developed the capacity for acting, which nobody had ever suspected her before, or else that she was thoroughly frightened, for now she behaved like a large rabbit, rabbit in tights. She, the unrehearsed appearance of the Demon King seemed to have upset her, and now and then she sent uneasy glances into the wings. Okay, let's leave the principal boy be frightened at his or her ease, and let's see if someone has left messages. No, I see no messages. No messages to answer to. Okay, let's go on. It had been decided, after a great deal of talk and rings round, to introduce a rather novel dancing scene into this pantomime in the form of a sort of infernal bullet. The Demon King, in order to show his power and to impress his captive, would command his subjects to dance. That is, after he himself had indulged in a little singing, assisted by his faithful six. They, they talk of that scene yet in Brothers Fort. <laughs> It was only witnessed in its full glory on this one night, but that was enough, for it passed into civic history and local landlords were often called in to settle bets about it in the pubs. First, the Demon King sang his second number, assisted by the Weaselian and his friends. He made a glorious job of it too. Then the Demon King had to call for his dancing subjects, who were made up by of the troop of girls known as Tom Bart's Happy Yorkshire Lasses, daintily but uh, demonishly tricked out in red and green. While the Happy Yorkshire Lasses pranced in the foreground, the six, attendas, the six attendants were supposed to make a few rhythmical movements in the background, enough to suggest that if they wanted to dance, they could dance, a suggestion that the stage manager and the producer knew to be entirely false. The six, in fact, could not dance and would not try very hard, being not only hooded, but also stubborn, brothers for the barito baritons. But now, the happy Yorkshire lasses having tripped them easier, the Demon King sprang to his full height, which seemed to be about seven feet two inches, swept an arm along the Weasley and six, and commanded them harshly to dance. And they did dance. They danced like men possessed. <laughs> the king himself beat time for them, flashing an eye at the conductor now and again to quicken, to quicken that gentleman's ba bacon. And his faithful six, all with the most grotesque and puzzled expressions on their faces, cut the most amazing capers, bounding high into the air, tumbling over one another, flinging their arms and legs about in an ecstasy, and all in time to the music. The sweat shone on their faces, their eyes rolled forlornly, forlornly but, they still, but still they did not stop, but went on in a crazier and crazier fashion like genuine demons at play. All dance, 
roared the demon king, cracking his long fingers like a whip, and it seemed as if something had inspired the fourteen cynical men in the, or in the orchestra pit, for they played like madmen grown tuneful, and on came the happy Yorkshire lasses again, to fling themselves into the wild sport, not as if they were doing something they had rehearsed a hundred times, but as if they were inspired. They joined the orgy of the bounding six, and now, instead of there being only one, only eighteen happy lasses in red and green, there seemed to be dozens and dozens of them. The very stage seemed to get bigger and bigger, to give space to all these whirling figures of, of a demoniac revelry. And as they all went spinning, leaping, cavorting crazily, the audience, shaken at the la at last out of its stolidity, cheered them on, and all was one wild insanity. Okay, I'll leave you thinking of this insanity while I read your message, your messages. No, I see no message, no message by now. Okay. Yet when it was done, when the king cried, stop! And all was over. It was as if it had, been, uh, it had never been, as if everybody had dreamed it, so that nobody was ready to swear that it had really happened. The Weasleyan and the other five all felt a certain faintness, but each was convinced that he had imagined all that wild activity while he was making a few sedate movements in the background. Nobody could be quite certain about anything. The pantomime went on its way. Jack was rescued by Jill and the Fairy Queen, who was now complaining of neuralgia, <laughs> and the Demon King allowed himself to be foiled, after which he quietly disappeared again. They were looking for him when the whole thing was over, except for that crowned entry of all the characters at the very end. It was his business to march in with the Fairy Queen, the pair of them dividing between them all the applause for the supernaturals. Miss Ferrer, feeling very miserable with her, with her neuralgia, uh, delayed her entrance for him, but as he was not to be found, she climbed the little ladder at the back alone to march solemnly down the steps towards the audience. And the, extra and the extraordinary thing was then, when she was actually making her entrance at the, at the top of, this, of those steps, she discovered that she was not alone, that her fellow supernatural was there too, and that he must have slipped away to freshen his makeup. He was more demonish than ever. As they walked down between the files of happy Yorkshire lasses, now armed to the teeth with tinsel spears and shields, Miss Ferrar whispered, I uh, wish I'd arranged for a bouquet. You never get anything here. You'd like some flowers? said the fantastic figure at her elbow. I think I would. <laughs> so would everybody else. Quite easy, he remarked, bowing slowly to the footlights. He took her hand and led her to one side, and it is a fact, as Miss Ferrer will tell you, within half an hour of your making her acquaintance, that the moment their hands met, her neuralgia completely vanished. And now came the time for the buckets. Miss Ferrer knew what it would be. There would be one, one for the principal girl, both by the management, and one for the principal boy, both by herself. Oh, look! cried the second boy. My gosh! Brother for, brother's Fords has gone mad! The space between the, or the, orchestra, the orchestra pit and the front row of stalls had been turned into a hot house. The conductor was so busy passing up buckets that he was no longer visible. There were dozens of buckets, and all of them beautiful. It was monstrous. Somebody must have spent a fortune on flowers. Up they came, while everybody cheered, and every woman with a part had, a, had at least a two or three. Miss Ferrer, pink and wide-eyed above a mass of orchids, turned to her colleague among the supernaturals, only to find that once again he had quietly disappeared. 
Down came the curtain for the last time, but everybody remained standing there, with arms filled with expensive flowers, chattering excitedly. Then suddenly, somebody cried, Oh, and dropped their flowers, until at last everybody who had had a, book, a bouquet had dropped it and cried, Oh! Hot! cried the principal girl, blowing on her fingers. Hot as anything, weren't they? Burning me properly! <sighs> That's a nice trick. Flowers that burns. That's interesting. Oh, oh, said the second boy once more. Look at them all. We are in a way. And they were, every one of them, all shedding their color and bloom, curling, writhing, withering away. Oh, uh, so the fun didn't last very much. Poor flowers. Flowers are ephemeral, after all. <sighs> Message come through for you, sir, an hour since, uh, said the doorkeeper to the manager. Uh, only I couldn't get it here uh, from the Leeds Infirmary, it is. Says Mr. Ayrton was knocked down in Board Lane by a car this afternoon, but he'll be all right tomorrow. Didn't know who he, he was at first, so couldn't let anybody know. The manager stared at him made a number of strange noises, then fled, sinking various imaginary temperance pledges as he went. And another thing, said the stage hand to the stage manager, that's where I saw the block last. Uh, he was there one minute, and next minute he wasn't, and look at the place, all scorched. That's right, said his mate, and what's more, uh, just you take a, a whiff, that's all. Just, just take a whiff. Oh, so started using brainstone in this theater. <laughs> Not me, nor you neither. But I a good idea who it is. <laughs> and I guess now you have a good idea of, uh, of uh, who was that mysterious actor. He was not Mr. Ayrton. <laughs> he was capable to make wishes come true. He left... Uh, he left uh, a smell of, um, of a brimstone besides him. <laughs> he scorched the place, he made the flowers uh, that burn, that burned. <sighs> he was the, the real demon king. What a night! <laughs> well, the, uh, this is a uh, this is a play I would have uh, I would have watched uh, very 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 lovely. <sighs> okay, guys, I hope uh, you have enjoyed uh, this. Um, this tale so far. This wasn't a proper ghost story, but it was a, a, um, it was a scary story. Nice. It's about a, a play that's typical of the Christmas period. Sorry, I have to refuse an invitation. I was saying uh, it was. Um, it was a ghastly tale typical of long winter nights and very, very enjoyable, at least if you like theater and if you like uh, the magic of theater. By the way, this uh, Demon King reminds me of Dionysus, the Greek god of theater, who was capable to, um, uh, to raise collective enthusiasm with the... Uh, with performances and dances, like this uh, Demon King has uh, done. Okay, now I'll propose you a proper ghost story from another book, that's this one. Its title is The Haunting Season, and its a subtitle is Ghastly Tales for Long Winter Nights. It's perfect. It's perfect for for winter, and it's perfect for this um, for this uh, show. We have read a, an enthusiastic tale of a, of a demon play. It was a, it was even um, funny. It was uh, it was ironical even. Now we'll read a much uh, much sadder story. It's about a very very strange sleeping beauty, a girl of a, of a, a girl 
who died at, when she was 16 years old and turned into a ghost. But uh, I won't spoil it now. You are going to, to listen to the story of Lily Wilt by Jess Kidd. Young Walter Pemble, the finest memorial photographer currently employed by Sturgeon Sons, photographic studio, first class portraits, portraits taken in all weathers, postcards, cabinets, plain or colored in the highest form of art, all pictures permanent and guaranteed to last the test of time, theatrical groups, invalids, recently expired children, residencies, equestrians, and so on, masters of all known and unknown advancements in fashion and meathood. <sighs> presents himself at a townhouse in Hanover Square at the appointed hour. He is brought before the master of the house. Mr. Wilt scouts up from his desk. Pemble bows and smiles uh, winningly. Mr. F Mr. Wilt fixes Pemble with a cold look. No funny business, says Mr. Wilt. No touching, leering or rubbing yourself up against the casket. Mr. Mrs. Wilton may believe that our dear departed daughter is an object of chaste veneration, but I know the effect my darling Lily has on people. Game bucks like yourself, most of all. Pemble is horrified. He blushes to the roots of his beard. Mr. Wilt is satisfied. And take a few of the visiting crowds for posterity. Visiting crowds, sir. We open at nine. Chop, chop. In a gilded frame on an easel outside the entrance to the drawing room, Pemble views the page from last night's paper bearing Lily Wilt's obituary. It is penned by a preeminent author and frequent dinner guest of Mr. and Mrs. Ramold Wilt. The preeminent author in language, the transports of wonder he experienced while gazing upon the deceased. In life, Miss Lily Wilt had been a puppet. In death, she is nothing short of a miracle. Her beauty, grave and sublime, her expression, enigmatic, her mortal shell exquisite and untarnished by natural processes. The preeminent author declares the late Miss Wilt to be an inspiration. Perfection, even in death, is possible. <laughs> the printed poem likens Lily to a nothing snowdrop, a nestled up, a dreaming lamb. A sight worth, worth seeing, indeed. The moment he sees her, Pemble cries. Pemble has never cried before, not even as a baby, not even a birth cry. It is unsadness that elicits the young man's tears, nor fear, not e nor even pity. <laughs> Pemble has seen his share of corpses. Little ones in lace-dressed coffins, venerable ancients in neat repose. Stiff and proper pillars of the community, buffed and nestled, the dead are like best spoons put away until Sunday. No. Pemble sheds his tears in wonder. His vision blurs so that the apparition before him swims, glows even. Pemble adjusts some complicated mechanisms of his camera and peers again. It takes him a moment or two to realize that the, the equipment isn't fault. It is himself. <laughs> now he regards his subject not through the lens, but with his neck dye. Her halo of a gold span hair, her narrow flank, the white gowned body, her palms pressed together like a martyr's, her face a saint in repose. Although not quite a saint, for her mouth wears the ghost of a knowing smile and has a certain plump lipped voluptuousness. Holy souls, usually being thin of lip, with a tendency towards uh, turn down mouths. Then a holy housemaid watches from the window. 
she is waiting for the photographer to finish so that she can release the velvet drapes. Deep scarlet, tasseled eight times the weight of her. And return the room to its state of all day night. Then she must roll back the carpet and take her position and bow her head as the nut crunch in public drift past her to go in the casket. She must call the footman if anyone becomes overwhelmed. Then she must attend the fires, set the table for the, same, for the servants' luncheon, listen to the carol singers and have a drop of something and a bite of figgy pudding. What with Christmas approaching and all that. Dumble takes his handkerchief from his pocket and wipes his face. He's sweating, although it is cold in the room. Arctic. Despite the hanged slant of, of winter sunning through the panes of the undressed window and the conflagration of a hundred tapering white candles, the air is solid and sickly with the scent of lilies. Legions of them, they arrive swaddled by the armful at the cellar door every morning from hot houses up and down the country. Lilies in the depth of winter with frost on the ground and ice at the windows. Her namesake flowers work, work the same pure intoxicating magic as the late lady, the only daughter of Mr. Rammel and Mrs. Guinevere Wilt, residents of a top-notch townhouse in Hanover Square, London. A house sunk in mourning. The mirrors are covered and the pendulums stopped. The windows are shattered and the door knocker tied about with a crepe. The family speaks in whispers and the servants talk in eye rolls. Pemble dips and twiddles at his camera, steps forward and back, stops to gaze and gaze and gaze. The housemaid gives a, <clears throat> a polite cough. Pemble blinks and uh, resumes his work. None has never seen anything like, like it. Mr. Pemble's strange dance with his contraption. He touches it with wary fingers, as if it might bite or run skittering from the drawing room. <coughs> with an apologetic air, he rummages about its skirts, sometimes disappearing underneath, reappearing to frown or move a bloom or an occasional table. She's not to know that. Mr. Pemble is an artist and an alchemist. This young man is capable of capturing the, the essence of the deceased. The very cut of their cheap as they sail off on their last adventure. Here is a young man who grapples daily with glass plates and dwindling, dwindling light, chemistry and dust. To create miraculous images in which the dead live again, reposing with a fine glow of health, captured in a state of freshness and fullness, in their exact prime of life, whatever age they were, for all eternity. Pemble could capture the soul's last flutter and preserve it for posterity. Only not today. Today Pemble's hands shake and his head spins and his breaths are taken in gulps. Uh, would you be so kind, he says to the housemaid hanging on to the curtains, as to fetch me a glass of water. Even with the housemaid gun and the room perfectly empty, he feels it, the unnerving sense that someone is watching him. Okay, of course, uh, this uh, tale is uh, set uh, in an era where photography was still at uh, its beginning as an art and, um, and as a technique. So you should uh, you should think of uh, those um, of those uh, photo cameras, uh, who, which were uh, big, uh, covered by black uh, by a black cloth, and and uh, you should also think of that uh, smoke that um, that went out from the photo camera when uh, when the photo was um, was was shot. It was really a miracle of chemistry and a, a sort of alchemy at that time. Now with uh, digital, with digital photo cameras, it's uh, so easy. We we can't easily figure, we can't easily imagine how it was when uh, when photography had been um, 
uh, had been uh, created for the first time. I don't know how to say, how to say it in English. Uh, photography at first uh, should uh, should probably seem uh, like a sort of magic to, to to people who didn't know anything about it. And uh, yes, there was also the, the habit to uh, to fo uh, to photograph to shot to shoot photos at dead people to preserve uh, their soul or their memory. There is uh, also a fascinating move movie based on uh, on a novel that tells about uh, this kind of photos. Um, perhaps you have seen the others or you have read the novel. It's uh, about this. It's about. Souls who never leave, souls who, who have been um, kept in photos and this kind of things. But let's go on, let's go on. Unless you have uh, any questions? No, you, ha you don't have any questions, it seems. Okay, let's go on. Nanny Holy traverses the drawing room floor on her hands and knees, sweeping up spent tea leaves. These things happen. A picture frame tips over, the candle flames gutter, a wintry breeze whisks about her knees, then sits back on her haunches, brush in hand. She frowns up at the casket, swogged about with black creep, the polished wood fogs as if with breath. Letters appear as if traced by a finger. L I L Y Lily. Nelly stands and casts a stern eye over the corpse. Luminous hands pressed together, oh, saintly-like. Only Miss Wilt was never a saint, nor with that mouth, the filth that came out, out of it. Nell detects a sly look under the closed lids. Ah, oh, now just you stay put, miss, she says firmly. Don't you go, don't you go gallivanting. Outside at the lot. The light is making a big point of its dying, tattooed rooftops against a smoky orange sky. The streets are a glorious festive muddle, hot chestnuts, orange cellars, shops lit by gaslight, the endless traffic of handsome and omnibus cart and barrow. Mrs. Peach's guest house, however, is as joyless as ever. A tall, thin, tired house with the frowning gables and grotty windows. The entrance hall is in darkness and a few degrees colder than the outside. Pemble takes the staircase at a bolt, his equipment strapped to his back for ease of ascent. He intends to avoid Mrs. Peach tonight. The door to her room is sprung, her feet patter into the hallway. Mr. Pemble, a word! Pemble breaks into a gallop, achieves his room, locks the door behind him. He has a burning question on his mind. It ignited the moment he left the dead young woman's side and had roared into quite the inferno. How can he hope to do her justice with his egg whites and his silver nitrate baths? Can he capture Lil Will's supernatural beauty? Pemble's churum attic domain is, is haunted by the scent of tripe and onions and afflicted by erratic slopings of the ceiling. At home he adopts a stoop for, for he bangs he ha his head often, never quite getting used to the deep and slant of the rafters nor the seasick nature of the floorboards. The smaller of the churum is his dark room. It is here he labors. The paper fox, the chemicals cloud. Ah, finally, as dawn breaks, a likeness. Pemble peers at the photography, the lilies arching their bases, the candles taper, the lovely corpse reposes. But wait! Wait! Pemble grabs a magnifying glass, turns up the gaslight, scrutinizes the image. Lint against the mantelpiece, looking dead at the camera with a twisted green stance. A trick of the light, surely.
a strange accident of chemistry, but it is her. <laughs> the perfect li little upturn knows the full lips, the halo of the fair hair. Lily wilt, and not quite a lily wilt. The bull takes a slow breath. The magnifying glass trembles in his hand. He sees a beautiful face. He sees a graceful body. He also sees a normal clock and a vase full of flowers through that face and body. Of course, <laughs> she's a ghost. How could you know it? <laughs> Let's see if anyone has said something. No, no messages. No mess. Okay. Oh, I see hearts. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like also some presents, if you don't mind it, because it would be, it would be important to me to monetize this streaming. But okay, if you can't send presents, I'll, um, I'll understand. Let's go on with the tale. Pamble returns to the townhouse in Hanover Square. He fights through the gathering crowds and gains access to the front steps where he admits to the butler that due to, to the intricacies and challenges of the photographic process, he has been unable to capture a satisfying likeness of Miss Wilt. Pamble is brought before the master of the house. Pamble bows and smiles weakly. Mr. Wilt glares up from his desk. He hears Pamble's excuses. Such is the reputation of a Sturge and Sons, by appointment to nobility, various and persons of high quality, and so on, and so on, sorry, that another session is granted. This is your last chance, Pemble. I won't have the viewings interrupted. People, illustrious types, are coming from far and wide to lay eyes on our dear dead Lily. Pemble thanks Mr. Wilt profusely. Mr. Wilt, with a snarl, turns back to his reckonings. How Lily's fame has grown! A steady file of people moves past the little casket. Nan stand, stands ready to nudge the mourners along if they get overly rapturous. Even Nan, in all her down to her wisdom, will concede that Miss Wilt certainly seems miraculous. Miraculous in the way that None of the natural processes you would expect to take place with the cadaver have taken place. The changes to pallor, the tempestuous collection and release of bodily gases, oh my gosh, the popping of the eyes, the passion out of the tongue and of the attendant horrors the Grim Reaper brings. An old woman lingers before the casket. God bless her. Why, she's a little saint. Behind her people, behind her people jostle, craning their heads to see. The old woman lunges forward with the pinking shares to snip herself off a relic, then calls for the foot then calls for the footman. The drawing room is empty. The public have been ushered out for the purposes of Pemble's final portrait. Nan has changed the candles and rearranged the flowers and straightened the tassels of the tarty rug. Mr. Pemble sets up his contraption. Nan takes her position by the curtains. Pemble <coughs> clears his throat. Uh, would you be kind enough uh, to fetch me a glass of water? Pemble waits, his gaze riveted to the fireplace. But no spectral vision of Lily Wilt appears. He takes a few steps to the casket and looks inside. He touches the edge of her coverlet, then her hands, palm to palm in prayer, like a child's. They are eyes. He bends and kisses her forehead, bewitched by her polar beauty. His lips tremble on contact. These things happen. A picture frame cracks on the occasional table. The candles burn blue. Laughter is cold and bright as early spring fills the room. And a honeyed voice at his ear. <laughs> Look through your contraption. Pemble takes his position at his camera, tangling in the skirts, fumbling with the focus, near to fainting with fear and yearning. 
Pembo cannot stop to consider the ifs and the whys and the wherefores, not with such an adorable spectre manifesting before his lens. Oh, how she manifests! This time she's not by the fireplace, she's leaning rakishly over the edge over the of the casket, blowing him a kiss like a girl in a soap commercial. Only Lily Wilt is perfect, perfectly translucent, perfectly beautiful. Pemble races to make image after image, the ghost of Lily Wilt draped diaphanously over a love seat. The ghost of Lily Wilt looking radiant by the pearl or palm. The ghost of Lily Wilt close enough to steam the camera lens if she had breath. <laughs> the ghost of Lily Wilt in the close dark behind the lens standing right beside him. A freezing mineral blast he shivers deliciously. You seem to know your way around this contraption, she whispers. You must be a man of science and learning. Pemble is flattered. <laughs> photography is an art to Miss Wilt. The very word photography is derived from the Greek terms for light and representation by means of... Yes, yes, look. I have a proposition for you. If you can put my spirit back in my body, I'm yours. Pemble groans in the dark. Lily, darling. I'm tired of being a spectacle. A small catch in the voice. There is so much I never got to do. The voice grows coy, like being a wife. Pemble sighs, well with tears, this time of joy. But then the enormity of her request strikes him. But how? Some trick with lightning, trips to cemeteries, that sort of, way, of a thing. You can figure it out. <laughs> Promise me you'll save me, dear. Uh, Walter, dear Walter, Pemble nods, I promise. Well, a very foolish, a very foolish and proud kind of promise, if you may say. Uh, dear Walter Pemble, do you think you are Jesus Christ? Do you want to raise up a dead woman? Okay, of course you have already guessed this can't be good. But let's see if someone has written a message. No message, no message, no message, but some hearts. Okay. Uh, let's go on. Hmm. It's a seven past six here in Italy. Okay. We have read the tales for an hour. Let's go for another hour. We have still so much to read together. It has started to snow. Great fat flakes lit by gas light, dancing and turning. Snow brushes against the window panes. <laughs> Snow lights on, on the rooftops. Snow settles on the eyelashes and noses of happy children. Pemble turns his face to the sky and is blessed with the soft, frosty kisses as it from the lips of his dear, dead beloved. He steps lightly through the jostle of London's streets. Like all young lovers, he feels blissful and damned, thrilled and terrified. Yes, love can be terrifying. That's why we talk so much about love in these streamings. <laughs> he delights in the windows, decorated with bubble and both. <laughs> he delights in the excitement of the street urchins ur teething hot pies. He delights in the arboreous procession of pine trees being barreled through the heaving streets. He delights in the people that pass by, laden with packages and parcels. It's Christmas time in the tale, of course. Christmas is but a week away. Christmas with Lily Wilt. Strolling, talking, sharing an orange, riding an omnibus, tumbling like puppies in the bed. <laughs> How Pemble blushes at this thought. <laughs> he just has the small and possibly profane matter of reuniting Lily's spirit with her body. Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a small issue. <laughs> that's a very, very small, a very small uh, work to do. Okay. Oh, she makes it so easy. But that's not easy, you know. He starts early in the next, mor 
in the next morning at Maladie's Landing Library. Driven by his passion to save his beloved, he's barely in intimidated by the hallowed main hall or the library clerks with their raised eyebrows and upbeat glances. He boils at every tick of the clock. He's irritated by every dithering spinster, murderous towards e each leisurely footman ferrying reservations to waiting carriages. <laughs> Finally, the book is in his hands. How to resurrect the dead? Oh, really? <laughs> There's a book for this? <laughs> Why didn't you say it before? It would be so, um, so nice to have this book in my own personal library. <laughs> Besides uh, the recipe books, how to resurrect the dead? How to uh, make it uh, at home in your kitchen? <laughs> no, gosh, let's, let's go on. I'm, I'm just joking. In a nearby alleyway, Pembol tears of the brown paper wrapping and is dismayed. This is not a helpful guide. It is a story about a returning sea captain and a plucky yet lonely widow set largely around Portsmouth. <laughs> so that's a novel, it seems, of course. Uh, what, uh, what, did he, what did he think? That it was a book of instructions about resurrecting dead people? Of course it's fiction. <laughs> Pamela could weep with the frustration. Then, revelation. Revelation, he heads to seven dials. Pemble purchases a hot toddy from a leering barmaid, nods nervously to the regulars and makes his way to a booth. It is, uh, it is said that at this pub, which shall remain nameless, anything in the world can be obtained at the price. Anything. Presently, a sly and somewhat dirty character slatters into the seat opposite him and touches his cap. In a low voice, Pemble gives a sense of his unnatural endeavor. He is directed to Camden Town. In a dark lane, down a dark passageway, in a dark recess, it's all dark, of course, is the facade of a gloomy bookshop. The sign above the door reads, Narcissus P. Tombs, bookseller, scientific and esoteric, taxonomy and taxidermy. Pemble hesitates a moment. <coughs> Screws closed his eyes and conjures the adorable shape of a lily wilt. Fortified, he steps inside. The shop bell rings. Dust most dense in the, in the sudden inrush of air. At first glance, the shop seems empty of a proprietor. Piles of ancient cobwebbed books cover every available surface. Shelves ascend dustily from floor to ceiling. Behind the desk sits a stuffed scritchel wearing a monocle. He's the very, very type of the magician, <laughs> actually. Uh, Pemble clears his throat several times. Movement in a shadowy corner, and from a veritable mountain of books, he rises a necked man with an impressive beard. Beard. Beard, this beard. <laughs> the one made of, of uh, hair on, um, on, on his face. Your clothes, sir! exclaims Pemble. I'm absorbing knowledge, says the man serenely. Okay, so perhaps I should try this. I should uh, sit naked on my books and absorb uh, knowledge like this. I'm such a fool. Why hadn't I thought of it before? I have spent so much time, uh, in, so much time in studying. I could simply sit naked on my books. Wow, genius! Of course, let's go on. I'm absorbing knowledge, says the man serenely. Are you looking for something in particular? Pemble relays his. Unenviable, quite unenviable, unenviable quest. Sorry, Mr. Toombs listens with an unwholesome glint in his dark eyes. Clad now in a silk kimono, he abstractedly scratches the animal pelt of his chest. From time to time, he nods encouragingly. When Pebble concludes, Mr. Toombs shakes his hand with a punishing grip. My dear boy, he fuses. You have strayed off the well-lit path into a world of thieves and costermongers, horns, uh, horse and laborers, artists, visionaries and, and gym palaces. 
reach with stink, even in the deep winter, reach with clamor, all hours, uh, what with the calling and, and jibing, fighting and loving. To come then, yes, you have come in the pursuit of knowledge, wishing to probe the very secrets of nature, finger the mysteries of life and death, verily to assume the role of God. You want to get your quivering hands upon tombs ancient and occult. Uh, if it's not too much trouble, <laughs> tombs looks to be deep in thought. His voice, when it comes, is grave. <laughs> there is a way, a profoundly weak and dangerous way, which is against every law, law of decency, morality and nature. That's encouraging. <laughs> well, that's really encouraging. What will Pemble do? Pemble prays. Well, of course. <sighs> A way which continuous tombs, when combined with a bit of surgical trickery, will have that lovely little cadaver, breathing and, breathing and sighing and blushing and playing the piano, the pianoforte for your heart's delight. Is it really possible, ventures Pemble? It's fully possible, my dear boy, to bring Lily Wilt back to life. Of course it's possible, it's so easy, it's only an evil way that will probably lead him to hell or to jail, but, uh, but of course, why should uh, he be afraid? Uh, let's see if you have written something, sorry, I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not trying to ignore you, but simply I have to read on and only stop sometimes to see if you have written. Okay, no one has written. While Mr. Toombs searches for the exact edition of the book with the secrets of life and death in it, he shares with the Pemble his own tragic history. <coughs> Once upon a time, Mr. Toombs had a very different career ahead of him. His great uncle Thaddeus read Tombs could take a leg off in less than two minutes. His father, Theodore, could liberate a tumor in one, a dynasty of surgeons, it seems. Such was the talent of this illustrious medical family that if you gave Tombs's granny a butter knife, she'd have your gallstones out before the tea was served. No, no knives to grannies, no knives to grannies. Tomsi's promising surgical career was cut short. Cut short for a surgeon, okay. Was cut short by a tragic affair of the heart. And I guess it was not uh, um, the heart in a physical sense in this, in this case. He fell in love over the dissection table. Of course, when a corpse is on a dissection table, uh, they are at their best, <laughs> they are perfectly looking, they are looking very fresh and very, and very healthy, and why not falling in love with them? Okay, um, someone has peculiar tastes, uh, indeed. Uh, however, Tombs fell in love over the dissection table. Okay, so moving, so moving, so sad, so sweet. Tombs poses in his recollections and throws a herald glance at Pemble. Such is the misery and horror and wretchedness that play on Tombs' face that Pemble cannot help but shiver. The corpse was a rare beauty. I was a brave and bold young man. Tombs' eyes fill with tears. Some sights you cannot unsee, Pemble. Some acts you cannot undo. When the tomb in question is found, the men share a decanter of decent claret. Tomb, tombs wraps in black paper the leather-bound book of monumental proportions and delivers it into Pemble's hands. He waves the many that Pemble counts out for him. Uh, I have but one final question before you leave. Tombs tightens the belt of his kimono and looks Pemble in the eye. What are you about to do is not for the faint-hearted, you must be certain. Of course he's certain. <laughs> is she the one you want? Pemble cradles in his arms the monstrously heavy book containing all the secrets of life and death. Lily Wilt, Lily Wilt, Lily Wilt. 
the sorcery in her name and in all of her. Lady Wilt is captivating. Pamble conjures before him her body lying in sweet repose. Her golden hair, the upturned button of her nose, the slim breast and their white lace, her downy arms and heavy lashes and the pearly little, na little nails. He conjures her voice, sweet and honeyed and girlish. He conjures her spirit, shimmering and blithe. Pembo is suddenly struck with the, with the indescribable feeling that he has always loved Lily Wilt, always worshipped her. She was fashioned for him and him for her. Yes, Pembo replies, Lily is the only one. <sighs> the work is long and hard. The ancient tomb lies open on his desk. Pembo pursues dreadful dreadful secrets through its yellowed pages the insights he seeks are inky news they flutter away just as his need to grasp in them of course uh, esoteric books are so easy to read <laughs> uh, i really pity this poor guy Pemble does not leave his rooms for a case failing even to keep his photographic appointments when his lips is plagued by the same dream. It is not a good dream, of course. How can you have a good dream when you read such stuff? He is in a crowded place amid the press of a mob of shabby young fellows. There is a din of shouting and jeering and ribbing. There is the smell of stale alcohol, spent tobacco and cheap hair oil. Dimly, Pemble begins to understand what he is witnessing. The men that surround him are medical students. This is a dissection theater. Silence falls. Double doors are thrown open and the body is stretched into the theater by two burly dressers. On the stretcher lies Lily Wilt. Bare legs, neck the feet, her trunk covered with a sheet, her face hollow and her hair Matted as after a long illness. A surgeon had bowed. The brim of his top hat pulled low, follows the stretcher, stepping in time. The medical students hum a requiem. Lily is maneuvered onto the table. One white alarm drops. Her golden hair spills. All the shabby young gentlemen in the room simultaneously sigh and lean forward. The surgeon nods to his assistant, who steps forward and rolls up the gentleman's sleeves. A butcher's apron, stiff with gore and terrible to see, is solemnly presented and tied about. The surgeon divests himself over his top hat. Narcissus P. Tombs, smiling benignly, surveys the collected audience. He turns to inspect the table laid with the instruments, tiptoeing his fingers along them. He selects a long, brutal, toothed saw. With a salacious wink, Mr. Tombs wanders to the operating tables and lays a hand on Lily's cheek. Her eyes open. Okay, this is something as a nightmare. I hope you won't have nightmare this night. <laughs> it is night in the townhouse in Hanover Square. Mr. Wilt is fast asleep. His grand uh, moustache flutters with uh, each fruity snore. Mrs. Wilt nests nicely in nightcap, wittering through her dreams of pug dogs and silver teapots. Downstairs, Saint Lily lies in state in the drawing room, cosseted in gauze and lace and silk, her hands placed in eternal prayer. The cook, the butler, the footman, the mice in the larder, the dogs in the kennel, allure, allure, all are slumbering. Only Nan Hooley is awake. She lights a candle and walks through the quiet house. She closes the door to the drawing room softly, and fires up the gas lights. 
There is school in the room yet, and the casket polished bright. But there is a, a smell, a smell of sweet decay in the air. The lilies are turning, their trumpets droop, their petals curl. Nell pulls up a, a chair beside the casket. Lily's face looks the same as it did on the morning of her death. Nell narrows her eyes and looks closely. After a while, she sees that Lily has, in fact, changed. Her beauty has faltered. There is a thinning of the full lips and a suggestion of a squint around the eyes so that the, cad the cadaver has a sour, peevish kind of look to it. The skin has a greenish pallor and there's a looseness to the, ha to the hair around the temples. Lily may be working some unnatural magic on the world, but no one can trick death. Ah, what are you up to, miss? What are you up to, miss? Nan whispers. These things happen. The picture frame hops on the table. The stopped clock on the mantelpiece starts ticking. The tassels on the turkey rug ruffle. Nan waits. The polish hood on the side of the casket fox letters appear. Lily leaves. <laughs> don't, you be get, don't you be getting ideas, Nan scolds. What you need, miss, is a nice peaceful burial. It's not seemly to be paraded about and gawked at, at by half of London. It's not natural. Nan fancies she sees a shadow of irritation across Lily's fine steel features. <laughs> by the way, I found uh, mm, moving and even nice the way uh, the way Nan talks to the corpse as if she was talking to her young pupil, to her young mistress. That's so tender. There's something so there's something so sweet and even motherly to this kind of relationship with a poor dead girl. I think only. Only kind-hearted nature can understand this kind of relationship with a dead person, as if you were taking care of them, even in death. Because, because death needs to be cared, to be cared about in its own um, way. Uh, dead people need uh, to be need to be buried, and even. Um, and even let to, to their peace, let alone. That's the that's the way we take care of our dead beloved ones. But okay, I'll go on. I don't want to, um, to bore you. She ponders for a while, her eyes on the sleeping face of Lily Wilt. By degrees, she resolves to seek the advice of a particular preeminent author and regular dinner guest of Mr. and Mrs. Ramold Wilt. After all, his obituary started all this. Nan is confident that she will obtain an audience with the illustrious gentleman, for hasn't he sketched a likeness of her in one of his popular stories? I guess she means the author who has written about the beautiful looks of um, dead Lily Wilt. The one we have, uh, the, the one uh, we have already mentioned when Pemble was uh, reading this passage. <laughs> I shall be having words with Mister B. You see, if I don't, he'll talk sense into your dear mama and papa. The, these things happen. The gaslights flare. The lilies shrivel in their vases, and an Arctic wind howls about Nan's ears. Nan, uncowed, closes the lid of the casket with an air of good riddance. Pamble wakes to a persistent tapping at the door. He opens his eyes. The pages of the Book of Life and Death lie rumpled beneath his cheek. The tapping stops and they are replaced by a determined knocking. He sits up at his desk. The door handle is tried. Rattled! A voice calls out! An insidious nasal whine. Mr. Pemble, who do you happen to be within? Pemble closes the book, 
hides it and manages to put on his trousers before Mr. Peach is in through the door, making light work of the lock. Pamble's landlady stands before him, a fright of a woman, thin as a string, all elbows and clavicles and a startling head of raven hair, not her own. Uh, do excuse my intrusion, Mr. Pemble. She gives him a bitter smile. I haven't seen you all week and what we'd been rent today. <laughs> she, she glances around the room at the bed that hasn't been slept in at the debris of half-eaten repast. You're intent on summoning rats to my guest house, Mr. Pemble? Oh, I think that uh, this landlady is the most uh, frightening thing in uh, all this gossip story. <laughs> That's a real horror. Uh, so, I run a clean establishment, Mr. Pemble. Oh, she's really scary. I'll bring the many down directly of her Pemble with all the politeness he can mark. Mrs. Peach crosses the floor. She lifts the curtain to Pemble's dark room and looks inside. Mr. Pemble, I thought we'd agreed that this is supposed to be your bedchamber. Uh, sorry, yes. Mr. Peach turns her attention to the prints that hang around the room. Pemble feels a rush of anger at the sight of Mrs. Peach peering and prying at the glorious likenesses of the corpse of Lily Wilt. Uh, that is it? Sadly. Poor little Popsy. Twelve. Seventeen. Consumption, was it? That great scourge of lovely young women. No, uh, not consumption. She squints at the picture. An accident, then? A funny shape to the, to the head, a bit of a dent to the temple here. Her head is perfect. Lily Wilt passed away in her sleep. This is Lily Wilt. Yes, the famous Lily Wilt. Pemble acquiesces. The perpetual sleeping beauty. The papers call her London's top festive spectacle. Mr. Peach casts, casts him an arch look. Only not for long. Pemble has a bad feeling. What do you mean? <coughs> Uh, she's been sold to a showman. Lily Wilt is to be shipped abroad, America, no less. Pemble startles. In aging, rattles Mrs. Peach, that little slip of a thing has a sobbed name after her. Pemble grabs his hat and great cotton rushes for the door. Um, Mr. Pemble, the rent, if you please. Pemble makes haste to the townhouse of the Wilt family in Hanover Square. At the doorstep, the butler takes note of these things. A disheveled appearance, a, wild, a wildness of the, of the eyes, a significant trembling of the hands and lips. The butler informs Pemble that in his absence, his esteemed employers, Sturge and Sons, dispatched their second finest memorial photographer, Mr. Stickles. Mr. Stickles visited promptly, conducted the session discreetly, and supplied Mr. and Mrs. Wilt with a selection of likenesses they are entirely enchanted with. Uh, could I just please one moment with, with Miss Wilt? I'm afraid not, sir. The butler closes the door. Fermi. <laughs> Pemble walks on. He hardly knows it is Christmas Eve. The merry crowds and dances know. A glad urchins and orange sellers, a hot chestnuts and, and bedecked the shop windows, all are lost on him. But then, oh, a shaft of light shines through the gloom. He's struck by a remembrance of his beloved. In his mind's eye, he invokes her jaunty spectre, her sublime saint-like body. He hears her cherish the voice again. Get your finger out, Walter, dear. I'm waiting. With renewed vigor, Pemble turns towards seven dials. Pemble purchases a hot to toddy from a surly barmaid, nods uh, no will need to the regulars, and makes his way to a booth. <laughs> Presently, the sly and somewhat dirty character slitters into the seat opposite and touches his cap. In a low voice, 
Pemble gives a sense of his criminal requirements. Dirty character sucks air in through his remaining teeth. Like this, I suppose. It all cost <sighs> double time. Christmas Eve and all that. Just make sure she's handled with care. Pemble remembers the rules of dealing with undesirables. A bonus for safe delivery. <laughs> Dirty character grins and tips his cap. We'll treat her like a snowflake. Midnight. A bundle is carefully hauled up the stairs of Mrs. Peach's guest house and into Pemble's attic room. The delivery is without incident, the landlady being insensible on a spike the gin. Pemble has the bundle taken into the dark room, the place he has prepared for the reunion of Lily Wilt's body and spirit. He's breathless with excitement, waiting for the masked man to leave. He locks the door behind them. Pemble's hands shake as he unwraps the package. He's awestruck, hardly daring to look at the physical form of his beloved in its entirety. Instead, he takes in little sips. Her delicate toes, lovely shins, the beautiful arch of her eyebrow, her dear stony cheek. Walter, dear, says a waspish voice, I've had quite enough of being spectated at. How about you get on with bringing me back to life? Pemble consults a tomb's a tomb on life and death. He checks off the needful equipment and runs through the procedure again in his mind. He tries to steal his beating heart. The spirit of Lily Wilt drifts about the room, shimmering in her form-fitting shroud, inspecting the images of herself. <laughs> I do take rather a good photograph, don't I? Pemble wipes his forehead. Yes, dearest, he hesitates. Uh, we, we could just uh, keep things as they are. I don't mind if you're a bit, uh, you know, incorporeal. Lily's glare is icy. Well, I do mind. You made me a promise, Walter. I want to eat bonbon and go out dancing. A lascivious note creeps into her voice. I want to taste the physical aspect of life again. Walter blushes and, and looks away. <laughs> I'll see what I can do, dearest. The mortal remains of Lily Wilt lie on a sturdy bench. Around the body, lanterns are lit. Next to the bench, there is a table. Pemble shud shudders to look at it, laid out with, with surgical instruments. Under the bench, there is a tin bath and several glass dimmy jones. So dusty scattered over the floor, in the corner of the room is a washstand holding a mysterious array of objects, among them a linnet swing, a mirror, a dish of chalk, and a chalice. Hours pass. The church bell rings out. It is Christmas Day. Lily Wilt, spirit and body reunited, sits in a chair by the window. She has a teacup full of gin and at her right elbow and is holding a roll of swabbing to her ear. She's wearing Pemble's nightshirt. Pemble averts his eyes from the angry stitches that traverse her decote. The dark room is a mess. The tin buff is full of gore and the sawdust is clotted in heaps on the floor. Surgical tools are bundled up in Lily's shroud and the linnet swing is stuck to the wall. Lily Wilt's eyes swivel to meet Pemble's. I want ice cream, she says, with all the tearful peevishness of, the, of a toddler. Well, I don't know what he's made. Probably a sort of taxidermia, you know. Uh, Lily likes to sit near the window watching the people pass by in the street below. Uh, mostly she's listless. She spends the day crunching nuts and uh, spitting out the shells. Occasionally she breaks in into ribald song. <sighs> Pumble is a runner raid, bringing Lily everything she asks for. She asks for books, ribbons, a spinning top, a bird in a cage, and a mandolin. Uh, a mandolin. Oh, guys, uh, I think 
I liked her more when she was dead. She, she was nicer. I want to go out to dancing, she wants. You must recuperate, dear. I am feeling worse, not better. What have you even done to me? Oh dear, you were, you were the one asking for uh, for coming back to life, so please don't complain. Do you think it has been easy? Ah, Pembo asks himself the same question. Oh now, so so uh, so he himself doesn't know what he has done to Lily. Oh, that's great. Lily has changed. She's she's changing daily. She has she has lost the alabaster complexion she had in death. Her skin sags and her teeth wobble. Her eyes sink and her golden hair dulls. Okay, perhaps, dear, dear Lily, you didn't know that life is change. Living means, means changing and also growing old, <laughs> my dear. Perhaps you had everything to gain staying dead. After all, dear Edgar Allan Poe said that, that there, there is nothing more poetical than the death of a beautiful woman. <laughs> You should have read Edgar Allan Poe when you were alive, my dear. But let's let's go on reading. Pembo walks to the river and looks into it. More snow falls and turns to black sludge on London's busy carriageways. At the newspaper stands, uh, news is shouted of Lily Will's disappearance. The grief of her doting parents is heartbreaking. The reward for her return astonishing. Pebble stakers past, pulling down his hat brim. It is too cold to sit in the park, so Pebble seeks refuge in the, in the taverns. He takes too strong a liquor. He needs it now. <laughs> he dreads sleeping, waking above all, going home. Lily has the bed dragged to the window, to the window so, she, so that she can look out during her recuperation. She carves pattern in the ice inside the window with her fingernails. She likes the sound. Well, you have a very, ba a very bad taste in music, my dear. Um, with Lily's recuperation come cravings. Lambs, cutlets give way to calves' livers. Calves' livers give way to cats' meat. Cats' meat gives way to cat meat. Oh no, cats, no! <laughs> no. But, Pembo the street at night in search of felines. You're a monster, Pembo! <laughs> he, he shudders as he hands over the wriggling sack, Lily smirks and draws the bed curtains. In a while, Pembo hears the abhorrent sounds of crunching and slurping. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Shortly thereafter, he picks up the discarded pelts and tosses them in the fire. <laughs> the rooms smell of singed fur. One day Pembo's feet straight towards Camden Town. Down a dark lane, down a dark passageway, da to a dark recess, everything is dark. <laughs> One more time. He stands before the facade of an abandoned bookshop. The sign above the door is too faded to be read. The empty shelves ascend dustily from floor to ceiling. The cats grow cannier. Pembo must hunt far and wide. He returns later to the lodging house. He climbs the stairs wearily, a, he a hissing sack over his shoulder. The door to his attic room lies open. Mrs. Peach stands, eyes wide, talking gibberish, talking gibberish by the side of Pembo's bed. Pembo has no need to introduce his landlady to Lily Wilt. The bed curtains have already been, op been opened. Fortunately, he still has the tin bath and surgical tools. Nan coolly haunts the street outside Mrs. Peach's guest house. Taking shelter under a shop canopy opposite, clutching her market basket and frowning up at the attic windows. The crossing sweeper has been taking note of Mr. Pemble's comings and goings. Nan pressing a coin into the boy's hand and he reports a curious state of affairs. Sometimes Mr. Pemble is abroad to buy goods, a music box, a pineapple, a caged canary. Other times Mrs. Mr. Pemble stays out half the night and returns with a wriggling sack. And now here is Mr. Pemble himself. With a furtive glance, he steps out onto the street, pulls up the collar of his greatcoat, and continues at a good pace. 
Nanny is, is shocked by the change in the young man. His eyes glazed and bloodshot, his beard tatty, his clothes strained, his boots filthy. She makes haste to follow him. At a disreputable dis tavern in Severn Dials, Nanny watches Pamble order a drink, sit, uh, sit down at the booth and stare into his glass. His face wears the countenance of the damned. Nan takes the chair opposite and puts down her basket. Pebble looks up at her and frowns. He knows her face, but he doesn't know where from. He must be really drunk. Mr. Pemble, would you happen to know the whereabouts of Miss Wilt? Recognition kindles in his eyes. You, you are the housemaid. Yes, sir. Pemble removes, removes from the pocket of his great coat a photograph. He sets it down on the table. I took this likeness of Lily yesterday. Please tell me exactly what you see. Nan offers Pemble her arm on the way back to his lodging house. Initially, he stumbles, but the cold air and Nan's strong, quiet presence seem to revive him. At the door, he smiles sadly. You know what you have to do now, sir, whispers Nan. Pemble nods. Fortify yourself, then. Pemble goes inside with a heavy tread. For a while, Nan stands looking up at the attic window. Then she tightens the knot over her shawl and makes her way homewards. The day of Lily Will's funeral is one of bitter cold and blue skies. The grave diggers have worked the long hours hacking into the frozen ground. The hearse moves steadily. Through the carriage windows, a casket can be glimpsed, glimpsed the, topped with a carpet of flowers. Six fine black horses clop through the, roll, the rolling clouds of their own hot breath. Mourners follow, muffled in black bombazine and creep with heavy lace. The hearse peak, peaks of fo the hearse picks up followers as it moves through London, so that by the time the cortege reaches the cemetery, the numbers have swelled. Lily Wilt continues to intrigue, to intrigue you. In the story of this sleeping beauty, there is one final mystery. Her body reappeared in the drawing room in, in Hanover Square as bathingly as it vanished. The public were relieved until they discovered that Lily Wilt would no longer be on display. Dark rumors abounded. She had been in the hands of one depraved. She had been modified in some unearthly way. The constabulary were not at liberty to say. The family made no comment. In the cemetery, the waiting stranger listens to the sound of the funeral carriage approaching. His heart beats faster as he sees the leading horses. They nod their black feather plumes uh, and pass him at a steady walk. Behind the carriage, the crowds trail, sniffing and moaning. In the trees, the crowds, always irreverent, swear and heckle. <laughs> and so, Lily Wilt is committed to her final resting place, a conspicuous family plot on the main thoroughfare. In time, a carved angel will be set there. It will rival even Lily's marble loveliness. The mourners depart, tipping down their hat brims, pulling their cape uh, around them and huddling into their muffs, leaving the grave diggers to their job of work. Nan Hooley stays until the last, just to be sure. Dusk falls, and Walter Pembo kneels by the grave of his beloved. He waits. Presently, he hears her voice. A little irritated. This is not quite the ending I had planned, Walter. Pemble looks up. Lily Wilt stands before him, her glacial beauty restored. Darling Lily. She bestows upon him a slitty smile. I suppose there is one way we can be together. Pemble nods, Debbie, his eyes. Pemble makes, makes his way out of the cemetery and turns himself 
in to the first constable of the law he comes across. It is morning in the townhouse in Hanover Square. In the kitchen, the butler reads the newspaper aloud and the housekeeper butters a slice of toast. Nan brings a pot of tea to the table. So, there it is, says the butler. He was a find! The housekeeper applies a dab of marmalade. A find, indeed! Of course, he killed the cats! He's a find and the devil, indeed! How could he kill all those poor kittens to, to feed that, uh, that wife of his? Oh. Then straightens the place settings and get her scrums. <coughs> Walter Pemble, latterly employed as a photographer, the butler reads aloud, is convicted of the theft of the earthly remains of Miss Lily Wilt, the perpetually sleeping beauty, from her family's home in Hanover Square. Mr. Pemble also pleaded guilty to the unlawful killing of his landlady who had discovered his crime. I think he would probably have killed her anyways because he didn't want to pay the rent, <laughs> but okay. The, the housekeeper touts, the butler sips his tea, depravity and dissolution. And cat's murder! And cat, and cat's is murder! All too commonplace, says the housekeeper, dissolution is. The man lost his mind, says the butler, in a tone that implied carelessness on the part of Mr. Pemble. <laughs> so uh, let me understand, the butler thinks uh, Pemble had lost his mind because he wasn't careful in hiding his crime, not because he had stolen a corpse and uh, fallen in love with it. <laughs> okay, okay. The butler has uh, his own uh, peculiar views on what... Uh, on what it means to lose one's mind. But let's go on. The housekeeper frowns. <laughs> Even so. Quite. Crowds gather outside the Newgate prison. Not that the hanging is public, but uh, the weather is mild for January and it's a day out. Nana Hooley is among their number. Uh, when the time comes, she sheds a few tears for Mr. Pemble. Poor guy, he deserves at least this. Later that, that afternoon, Nan takes out the old cigar box she keeps under her bed. Inside there's a, a silver thimble, a lock of, of grey hair, a few faded flowers and a photograph. She looks at the photograph for the longest time. Then she strikes a match and applies it. The paper twists and bursts into flame and with it, Lily will scream. Now Nan drop, drops it into the crate. She stands a while, deep in thought about life and death and that awful thing in between. A little while later, she manages half a rabbit pie. And this is the end. This is a very strange way to retell the story of the Sleeping Beauty, but it was quite um, striking. <laughs> and. Uh, it was also very thoughtful. Uh, it has made me meditate on the thing between life and death, impossibility to let a dead one go away and find their peace. <sighs> poor, uh, poor Mr. Pemble at least had to, um, had to face a death penalty to be together with his beloved Lily. How sad, how sweet, how... How scary, <laughs> okay. But it's also romantic in a sort of way. And uh, in this tale, uh, in this tale that's in this book, uh, we also see something that uh, was very typical of the Victorian era. We see, uh, we see the theme of uh, the ghost photos, because really in the Victorian era, there was this uh, fashion uh, to to make photos where, uh, where there were sort of ghosts. If you, if you find these uh, photos, these uh, photos from the Victorian era, from the Victorian age, you can see these, uh, 
uh, these figures, these, um, these translucent images in photos who were uh, believed uh, who were believed uh, to be ghosts. Of course, they were uh, they were tricks, not real ghosts, but but uh, they were considered real at the time, and they were very popular. After all, Victorian um, the Victorian age was this um, strange mixture of uh, science and occultism, uh, of um, pragmatism and uh, esotericism. Can I say can I say this? Is this the right word? The right word. <laughs> Victorian English people could uh, uh, make a seance and uh, and enjoy and enjoy scientific uh, discoveries as well. They didn't find any any contradiction in all this because they simply enjoyed knowledge and uh, and novelty, whatever it came from. Okay, what can I what can I say? We still have uh, four minutes uh, to spend uh, to spend uh, together. Let's see if any one of us has written. By the way, okay, I see I see many hearts. I see many many guests. A big audience. We had uh, sixty hearts. Oh, thanks, but. Uh, no messages. Okay, you you were silent during uh, during the live. I guess this was because oh, two new messages. No, no messages. Just uh, hearts. Okay, <laughs> so many hearts. Thank you, thank you, Marwa. Thank you. So I guess you I guess you were silent because uh, you all uh, like the <laughs> like the details. Actually, they were thrilling. It were, it were the best to enjoy here by my fireplace, by the Krampus's fireplace. <laughs> uh, I am a sort of Christmas uh, ghost uh, as well, even if I'd like to be called a Christmas demon or a, cre or a, a winter god, if you prefer. <laughs> okay, if you go to northern Italy, to Trentino Alto Adige, or even uh, to Slovenia, you can... Uh, see me on uh, the night of the 15th of the 5th december sorry together with saint nicholas uh, who um, who leads uh, several krampuses like me <laughs> and uh, he also um, keeps us quiet he needs to keep us quiet so we won't use our whips too much <laughs> of course you can also bring your children that night if you want to educate him to see what happens if they are naughty uh, and you can also you can also bring your children to meet saint nicholas of course the uh, the so-called krampusnacht is not all about fright you see it's also something about light, about the hope of a new year, of a new crop, of a new sun, uh, whatever you want. Or, that's why I have a golden horns tonight, by the way. Let's hope I don't lose my horns. As the wise man says, don't lose your horns. Mm -hmm. So I have to. Okay. Uh, it's been all so lovely. I would have... Uh, lots of books to share with you because Christmas ghost tales are uh, are uh, very 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 famous it's also a literary genre that has uh, been uh, very very fruitful to, for uh, for authors at the end of uh, the 19th century and also the beginning of the 20th century now it's uh, not um, it's not well known, but uh, it's, uh, it still has uh, its charm. Uh, by the way, I could show you another book. Perhaps, perhaps uh, this is uh, a little more modern, Ghosts of a Christmas Past. It also includes uh, a, a tale by Neil Gaiman. Uh, by Neil Gaiman, you surely know him. 
is a famous weird writer. I mean, he writes weird tales. I don't mean he's weird himself. I don't know. He may be. Okay. I hope uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Jennifer Radulovic, is watching us. If she is not, uh, I, I greet her uh, nonetheless because uh, she's a great uh, storyteller and also. Uh, also a great teller of gothic stories, even if uh, she's mainly an historian, a, a very good, a very good historian who's capable to tell our past and our history um, without boring us. And uh, it's also the time to, um, to say you goodbye. Goodbye, Happy New Year. Uh, thanks for, heavy, for having me here by the fireplace of Krampus Eric, and thanks for having shared uh, these, great, uh, these great tales with me. Let's see if anyone else has uh, left a message. No, but I see many hearts. Thank you for your hearts. Thank you for your hearts, and see you. Happy 2024! Bye!